The government will impose financial sanctions on individuals and entities engaged in human rights breaches. It will also implement a travel ban on 16 sanctioned individuals in Myanmar. Let's bring in the independent MP, member for Goldstein, Zoe Daniel, who has spent a long time uh, campaigning for these sanctions and has spent a long time working in Myanmar herself as a fo former foreign correspondent. Zoe, thanks for your time. I know you welcome the sanctions, but you believe the government needs to go further. Yeah, I do welcome the sanctions, Kieran, very much. Uh, I know that the Australian government's been quite cautious on this, in part because Australian Sean Turnell was in jail in Myanmar. He's now safely home in Australia, thankfully. But what I've been saying for many months is that as Sean was languishing in jail, as you heard the foreign minister say, so are many thousands of Myanmar people. There are also villages being indiscriminately bombed by the Myanmar military. There is a culture of intimidation and repression uh, and many civilians, men, women and children have been murdered. Uh, so it is welcome that some sanctions have now been implemented. And as I say, it's a beginning. I think we could do more. Uh, but starting with these 16, not only individuals, but also two state-owned companies, which are a conduit for foreign currency into Myanmar to fund the sort of military activity that I'm talking about is a good thing, uh, but it won't completely turn off the font of money that is going into the country. And I think that's the next step. Because it's uh, those companies, as you point out today via your statement, that line the pockets of the junta. Yeah, look, it's difficult sitting here in Australia to understand kind of how it works. But you, you have a, a country that for decades was under military rule where there are some incredibly powerful military generals and former military generals who are incredibly wealthy. Uh, and it is because of the yield from that foreign currency. So they hold the economic power and they hold the political power. It's really to do with cutting... Uh, the funding to those generals and also to the military in order to squeeze the junta uh, away from the sort of behaviour that it's been exhibiting since the coup two years ago. And, you know, next steps in my mind are the two big uh, mining entities, Myanmar Mining Number 1 and 2, uh, which will still be a way of bringing foreign currency into the country to fund things like aviation fuel that's then put into military jets that are then used to bomb villages full of innocent civilians. And this has been happening for the last two years in a country that is on our doorstep. And, and indeed, and, and tragic sort of set of circumstances. When you look at the hope, there was a, a fair bit of hope not that long ago, wasn't there, in terms of that democratic uh, reform under Aung San Suu Kyi? Look, when I first started working in Myanmar, Kieran, it was still a closed country. It was before the 2010 election. It was when Aung San Suu Kyi was still under house arrest and had been under house arrest for many years. And, and then she was released. Uh, there were people on the streets. There was ecstasy that there was a, a degree of freedom. There was a, a form of democratic election, although the majority of the parliament was vastly stacked with the military, members of the Opposition National League for Democracy were elected and able to enter the parliament. So there was just this, this, this eruption of hope in Myanmar, this brief glimmer of freedom. And, and in many ways, it feels even more tragic that it's now perhaps even an even worse state than it was previously, with people either displaced within the country, uh, a million or so people, and a million or so people having to flee the country, uh, many of whom are hiding on the Thai-Burma border, for example. And the other thing to point out is that a lot of their family members, friends and colleagues are here in Australia. You have a large Myanmar diaspora and it is really difficult for them too. Just finally, on The Voice, we've um, had confirmation today of the, the board of the Australians for Indigenous constitutional recognition, but basically the Yes campaign, along with some corporate heavy hitters like Catherine uh, Tanner and Michael Cheney. A couple of Liberal strategists, Mark Texter, Tony Nutt, uh, on that board. Um, we've heard Dominic Perrottet as well come out very strongly in favour of uh, The Voice, and he's reiterated that today. What's your read on where this campaign is at? Do you think it's precarious right now? 
Uh, yes, but it is early uh, and I'm ecstatic to see Mark Texter on that campaign team. He may be a Liberal strategist, but he is one of the most brilliant campaigners in the world. So uh, if he's there, that, that is a very good thing. Uh, look, I think we have time to just have a measured community consultation and conversation about this, just to talk about the facts and the principle that we're trying to execute to step into this invitation that our First Nations people have given us um, with the proposal, the Uluru Statement and the Voice, uh, and just how that can contribute to the future of our country in terms of the way we interact with each other, the way that people like me as a parliamentarian can get real information from Indigenous people to help me to make the sorts of decisions that I have to make and others in the parliament. I think it's a very exciting moment and I just hope, Kieran, that it doesn't degenerate into a partisan debate based on fear. I think we all have to be quite generous and just step in and listen and then get the facts and vote based on those. Zoe Daniel, member for Goldstein. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Thank you.